Welcome back to the Deep End podcast. I'm your host, Samantha M. And today we have a guest, a person who I consider a mentor, a friend, somebody who I value so much. And this person is Damien Bola. Damien has been working in the field of relationships for over 10 years. And I'm so, so, so excited to have this conversation. I value and respect Damien so much. The level of integrity is second to none and the balanced and uh, holistic approach to, to, to relationships is something that I've not seen a lot of and I really, really love it. So I'm excited to have this conversation. Thanks for being here, Damien. Thanks for having me, Sam. Pleasure as always. So I'd love for the listeners to to learn a little bit about you and your history what what's what's your what's your background where have you been in the field of relationships hmm I mean um, a nice long journey of pain and discomfort generally (laughs) it's probably most of my history um yeah (laughs) yeah you know I I my, my my some of my earliest memories were experiences of feeling rejected by the feminine by girls like i have memories as early as like four or five years old of like being shunned and rejected and and had this like ache for connection and just total at a loss confusion for most of my all the way through school all the way through my teenage years up into my 20s where i finally started having relationships but they were like tumultuous conflict filled you know some of them long term but you know lots of conflict or disconnection or just a lack of the depth that I started to realize I really wanted and so um, I think relationships has been something that has been like painful and fascinating for me for my whole life and and really the last 10 10 to like maybe even up to 14, 13, 14 years, I've really, I've spent a lot of time investigating and trying to understand relationships through a wide variety of things, authentic relating. I spent some time studying seduction and pickup artistry. Um, You know, I've looked into things like Tantra, you know, later starting to study attachment theory and trauma, you know, polarity and, and the relationship between the masculine and the feminine. So I've kind of just looked at it from all of these different angles, trying to make sense of what this thing is and what was really driving it was, you know, like I had that early desire for connection and wanting to be intimate with the feminine and really just not managing to like just rejection was my childhood and high school story, just constant, you know, like, you know, I still have a bit of, bit of grief and pain around all of that. Um, But around the age of, I think it was 20, 21, um, I was in a relationship and I picked up a book at a secondhand bookstore called The Multi-Orgasmic Man. And I started reading and I was like, like my jaw dropped, you know, I was, I was a late sexual bloomer. But when I started having sex, I was like, oh my God, I can't get enough. You know, like all I want to do is have as much sex as I possibly can. And then I started to go, oh, wow, I can actually, you know, work with my own sexual energy, conserve my ejaculation. And as a result, have even more sex, you know, that was like mind blowing, but really what peaked out of there was this possibility, this little glimmer of a possibility of waking up with somebody, you know, I I come from a back Buddhist background. My parents are Buddhist. They're hardcore meditators. They're really deep into the awakening process from a Buddhist mythological lens. They're Vajrayana or Mahayana Buddhism, which is Tibetan Buddhism. So it's very mythological, although they take it literally. And, um, you know, so they're in, you know, my dad's on this like enlightenment path. That's his life goal is to become awakened, to become enlightened. And I rejected that, you know, I was like, I get it. I understand it. But I, I realized that like something woke up in me and I was like, I want to wake up in two bodied form as David Data talks about it rather than one bodied form. I want to wake up with somebody. So that was the first glimmering. And then that's been something that's been driving me ever since. And, you know, part of the thing is actually just having a, having just a relationship full stop is challenging enough, let alone add an awakening element to it. So there's like a whole, yeah. Uh, that I might just leave it there. 
<laughs> see where you want to go with all of that. This is, uh, it's great because it makes so much sense about your your business that you're building right now or that has been built as evolutionary relating. It just makes total sense where it all comes from. Yeah. And I guess the reason why I'm so attracted to your body of work is because of this main theme of evolution that's weaved in relationships and the awakenings that can take place when we, when we explore that space. So what have you observed in, in working with people and running the countless workshops that you've, you've held and, and, you know, facilitated and supported um, what have you found as a common thread um, that supports this this belief around the evolution that can take place in relationships? Well, the body of work that I'm working on is like, it's quite a big elaborate thing that I'm wanting to bring into the world. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of elements to it. And right now, like, we're just building out the very cornerstone of the whole thing. It's like one piece is we're just almost got it, you know, like leveled and like, okay, that's, um, that's a piece. So I, I have desired to, to, to bring this work into all these other dimensions, but what I've really been facilitating and promoting for, for most of this time so far is authentic relating. So authentic relating is a, is a communication skill set it's a set of skills that allows us to communicate more effectively basically in a way that brings out more of our deeper or authentic or unique self um, so that we can express it more and listen to the other person and so like if you ask what have i found i mean if if we're looking at the from the side of challenge first thing i most people don't know how to listen properly or express themselves vulnerably like literally that's that basic level is I would almost like 95% of people, I would say, just start there. Like if you get that bit, everything else starts unlocking. I kind of think of this as a master key. Like actually, can you listen to a person so that they feel safe enough to be themselves with you? If you can't do that, you cannot have an evolutionary relationship. You just can't, like there's no space for it. Can you express yourself clearly, your vulnerability separate from your criticisms and your judgments and your projections and your assertions about another reality? Most people can't. Most people tangle their ideas about another person or the world and throw them at the other person expecting them to deal with it. And this is where all conflict abounds from generally. So listening cleanly, expressing cleanly is probably the fundamental starting point. You know, that's why the course is fundamentals of authentic relating. It's the fundamental starting point for this whole journey of wanting to have an evolutionary relationship, wanting to relate in a way that evolves and grows us. Like that's that that's the cornerstone as far as my opinion goes. As somebody who has participated in this program, mm. I can confirm how much this has transcended and transformed the way that I show up in my relationships, um, particularly in my romantic relationship currently. Um, I notice these old patterns of behaviors that like to reveal themselves and like invalidate and try and fix. And it's just this conditioning of like not truly listening and not really hearing somebody um, because we haven't actually been demonstrated a healthier alternative. And that's what I love about this program is that it's an, a healthier alternative to what we know. And it is one that invokes that evolutionary path. So what do you, my next question is around, you know, the other side, like you, this is, this is great. This is an amazing antidote to the, the, the unhealthy symptoms that we experience in relationships. Um, I want to talk about trauma because I feel like that's what the root is of these unhealthy behaviors that show up in our relationship dynamics. So we had a really interesting conversation once about trauma um, and I'd love to explore that or just dabble into that again. Um, in the field of relating, how does, how does trauma show up in our relationships? Mm. So, you know, you're right in that the assertion that it's our trauma that causes these unhealthy relating patterns. And I would say like, that's a, it's partially true, partially like you kind of, you said it both. So, so one side is yes, we don't actually have good models, you know, and we've been, we've received poor 
r- relational models or communication models from our parents and our peers and our school teachers. And largely we've, most of us have lived our life being invalidated, right? Being invalidated for our own experience from an early age. And I've, I'm living with my partner who has a seven year old son and I notice my tendency to want to do that too. And it's like, oh, like I have to catch myself and be like, no, like I cannot invalidate his reality. It's just not fair. Right. And it sets up this pattern of like, this is what we do to everyone else. So it's partly we have poor relating patterns. And then what happens is when we're, when we grow up having our reality invalidated, that's actually trauma. Right. Now we have a, like a spectrum of trauma. So this is like what we would call mild, you know, it's a really mild trauma. However, if you receive consistent invalidation and it could be so benign right but consistently like you know you go whenever you go to your mum, you have a problem you're a child and you go to your mum with a little problem and your mum immediately goes into fix it mode and doesn't actually validate your emotional experience when you grow up firstly you're going to relate to other people that way potentially and they're not going to feel like they have space to share their experience and secondly there's going to be this like tension around like, like inside starts to develop this narrative of like, my experience doesn't matter, right? My emotions don't matter. My experience doesn't matter. And that's a mild form of trauma. And then we can go all the way up to, you know, along a great gradation to when you were actually received, like say mental, you know, f- forms of mental abuse where you, you have a feeling and your, your parents talk you out of it, or they try and talk you into seeing something different, or they threaten you. If you don't do this, you can't that, you know, like they're very, ben- they seem very benign in terms of parenting and so common and normal. And yet what they do is they set up insecure pathways in our brain and our nervous system. And when we grow up and we, then we start getting into romantic relationships, those pathways get activated and we relate to our partner, the way that our parent related to us in invalidation, um, you know, and, and we also get, re- we, then we express it in other ways. Like we get anxious or we get avoidant. So it's like, I just, there's a lot there. Right. And so that if we can continue, I just want to continue the spectrum. So then we go all the way up into like more direct abuse. There's mental, there's mental forms of, you know, control and dominance that change the way we think, you know, to the more extreme forms of like mental gaslighting. And we can do this to children in such uh, seemingly innocent ways, you know, or there's emotional, you know, if the, if the parents are overly emotional, or they rage out or you're seeing the parents in fighting with each other, or, you know, you actually receive physical abuse or emotional abuse, like being shamed or yelled at, or, you know, and then all the way up to sexual abuse, right? So all of these things create a trauma, which is essentially a dysregulation, a a pathway of dysregulation in our nervous system, which is a survival pathway. So when we receive a similar stimulus, our body goes into fight, flight, freeze, fawn, faint. There's a, you know, there's a whole variety of reactive ways, but they kind of, we go into an unconscious survival process and it's really defensive, you know, defensive process, but then they come out in our relationships and we have you know, we have a mess of a relationship where we're just fighting with each other all the time and defending. And it's just like, it's just gets crazy. Right. And these are all early things that were set up in our nervous system. Wow. I'm like taking deep breaths as little images of my childhood yeah. flash before my eyes. Cause like, you know, I think that the, there's an accountability piece here, you know, like, but then there's also, yeah knowing that our parents actually didn't know any better. So for anybody listening, this isn't a blame game. This isn't about offloading the responsibility onto our parents because that can happen when we're on these personal development journeys and when we learn new information like this, you know, we we victimise ourselves, but majority of the planet are, are experiencing this. Like we're all in this together. So um, uh, can I just jump in with that? Please. <laughs> so, so I like what you just said, you know, it's not a blame game and actually going down the path of trying to figure out every little thing that had happened to us and the way it impacted us and trying to like figure out like what our parents did and didn't do and all that is actually a dead end. It's not actually how you heal this trauma. So there are, there are psychological processes that's called psychoanalytic therapy, which is, which is really about exploring that personal history. And there is a benefit to it. And, and, 
you can do it if the intent is to actually release and complete the stories that, that are trapped in our body. That can be helpful. But actually, the healing takes place right now. Like the healing doesn't take place by trying to send ourselves into the past and like figure out all the little things and then come to our parents, you know, with a list of all the things they did wrong and try and make them say sorry for it. It doesn't work. Like doesn't, doesn't actually heal anything. So I just wanted to put that out there as like, that's not, we want to understand where it comes from more so just to like, give us a sense of like, oh, okay. In a way this, this happened, this is stuff that happened to me. And my, my nervous system has set itself up in a way to defend against this happening again to me. Mm-hmm. And it's not really me. Actually, yeah. it's a reactive pattern. It's not really me. And recognizing that can allow me to like be a bit more forgiving of myself when I, you know, operate from these places and then just like relax and actually do the healing work. I resonate with that so much. Um, and what I would love to ask you is what your opinion is of timeline therapy and reparenting I feel like there's a little there's a bit of a correlation between the two like going to going back into our history and revisiting these traumatic experiences that we've had and then reparenting ourselves in that that's what I've had that's what I've experienced in my healing journey what do you think about that yeah I mean I think for me reparent like I like to go all the way down to first principles. And I've been talking about this a lot lately. My, my nature tends to be to want to understand first principles. And, and what first principles mean is like, what is the underlying bedrock that is free of interpretation that is just kind of consistent across the board? And so for me, like inner child work and reparenting is, is a metaphorical approach to this there's there's total total merit in it right it's actually it's valid but the 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 idea of the reparenting or the inner child work is actually a metaphor for describing what is actually happening physiologically and it's a way to use our you know our metaphorical mind and we actually think in metaphor all the time everything we do is metaphor right it's like our language is built on metaphor Um, you know, even that I just said built on our language is built on metaphor. That's a metaphor, right? You know, it's like built the idea of building. And so anyway, we, we are metaphorical beings. So we, we, that's an, an, an effective and efficient way to work with our stuff is to work with kind of our metaphorical mind or our imaginal mind and the reparenting and the, the inner child stuff. But what we're actually doing is we're working with early parts of our brain, right? And, and those parts, something called the amygdala, there's the amygdala and the hippocampus, and there's this like part of our brain in the back of our brain. And when we're quite young, it's actually larger. And it's, it, 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 it performs a, a heightened function in setting up defensive patterns. It's part of our learning and it's part of our like primal survival learning, if, if, if you will. It's setting up, you know, like if you ever see dogs playing, right, and they're like, puppies and they're like a puppy playing with the older dogs and they're fighting right and they're doing their fighting rolling around they're learning survival patterning and we do that too we learn how to survive that as children we're here to come and learn how to survive and make it in this crazy chaotic world and so we're working with these very basic survival patterning in our brain and it's been whacked like it's been it, because we're also interpersonal beings, we're relational beings. Our survival is dependent on actually how good our relationships are. That's what determines our survival. If you go back to a tribal level, if you get kicked out of the tribe, you die. You know, you die on your own, right? And if you're on your own, you can't reproduce our species, which is one of our biological impulses, you know, imperatives. So we're working with this early survival brain and it's been set up in a not a very functional way. We, it's been set up to think that the people closest to us are dangerous in certain ways, right? And we're basically, when we're reparenting, we're restructuring that part of our brain. New, the theory of neuroplasticity, which has come out in the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years, recognizes that our brain actually is able to reshape itself. Our nervous system reshapes itself when we give it new stimulus. So if we are are focusing on our healing and we're learning to soothe our own anxiety, we're learning to find different pathways when we get into, you know, fight defensive patterns, you know, in conflict, 
we are literally restructuring our nervous system to be an entirely different way. And so reparenting is a metaphor to describe what that restructuring is. And you can do that with imagery and you can go in and you can see the, you know, you could do meditations where you like, you close your eyes and you actually see your mum and you notice a wounded pattern. You, you, you see your mum giving you the kind of care that you really needed. And that actually learns to soothe and your body goes, okay, I'm safe. And it actually goes, okay, we can now use a different neural pathway, this one wide of safety. You know, we can go into more technical terminologies about that, but perhaps we don't need to. So, yeah. I love this. This is amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, the, as you were speaking, I was like practicing what I've learned in the fundamentals of authentic relating and noticing the parts of myself that are just like wanting to run away with things that you've said, but then bringing myself back into embodied listening. And I love the ripple effect of this program and how it has supported me in showing up more authentically in my relationship so I can fully receive what is, um, what I'm experiencing. Um, and so, you know, what I also love about the work that you do and what I resonate with is holding ourselves present to the moment because I I feel like in my experience and the experience of, of clients, what I've seen and what I've observed and what we've spoken about is the in the moment transformation and healing that can take place when we repattern the trigger. Because the triggers just teach us, you know, what do you think about triggers? Tell me about well, firstly, I want to, I, I love what you just shared of like being in the embodied listening and noticing the tendency to want to run away with it and stay and said, and it's like, it's real time repatterning actually, because when we run away with our thoughts, we're entering a kind of mild dissociation, right? And a lot of our triggers are actually projections of a reality that isn't true. It's me, like a, a past defensive pattern getting kicked into gear. So I'm getting triggered some like some representation, some something is happening that mimics something I experienced early in my life. Say, say you've gone straight in. I've, I've come with an emotional feeling and you've gone straight into advice giving, which is a pattern that I experienced with my mom that has me pained about feeling my reality is invalid. And I kick straight into this projection of you being that person. And now I'm doomed to this relationship. I don't even, this is happening so fast. We can't track it, right? You, I'm being doomed to a relationship. This is what's going to happen. You're a terrible person. All of a sudden I'm in projection land and I'm triggered, right? And I'm reacting to you. And it can be so simple, like so mild. And when we're sitting in that presence and I'm like bringing my mind back, I'm not allowing that future projection to occur, right? I'm actually, I may feel you know, if I'm present with my, my body and when we, when we talk about in, you know, embodied listening in fundamentals of authentic relating, we talk about listening from the sensation, listening from the emotion and listening from the thoughts, right? If I'm listening in a really present way, so I'm, I'm letting what you say just wash through my mind. I'm watching any feelings that arise and opening and accepting any feelings that you're experiencing. And I'm watching the somatic experience in my body. I'm noticing or tracking little ripples of anxiety. So I'm actually seeing the little ripple of anxiety that runs through my body that precedes a trigger. And so I'm much more aware of the thing happening before it even happens. This is one way of working with triggers, right? When we're working relationally. So I can see it and I can actually name it in the moment. And I don't have to run away with my thoughts into some idea of who you are, you know, and I can stay with you instead. I really like that. It's a bit of a reframe because in my personal development experience, sometimes, well, the, a belief that I have is that triggers often carry a truth that's yet to be revealed about ourselves or uh, uh, reveal a part of ourselves that is yearning to be loved or to be accepted. Um, what do you think about that? You can disagree with me. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I, I would say that every trigger is is something that needs to be healed and, and love is healing, right? It's it's needing the love to actually heal itself. And 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 that is the repatterning, right? You know, this is a wounded part. So there's something I, I reveal a little bit from behind the scenes of my life. There's something, you know, my partner and I, we drop we're dropping deeper and deeper into some of our core wounds. And we've got this practice of actually speaking the speaking the thing that the other person needs to them and every time it's like my body goes through a little like oh like 
restructuring. I feel my nervous system changing when I hear these words said to me over and over again, for example, like, you know, what I found that I really need is actually, I care about you. There's a inside of me is this, you know, from what I shared at the beginning of the podcast, right? Lots of early experiences of rejection. And, you know, there were certain, you know, my parents are beautiful humans, but there are certain ways they related to me that set up a pattern that has me believe and there's also, if we look at human design, it's also written in my design. It's very interesting when you start putting all these pieces together, but that's for some other time. Um, has me feel this fundamental sense of nobody cares about me. That's probably one of my deepest core wounds, right? And every time my partner says to me, I care about you, and I've let her know, like, actually, if I'm really triggered, the only thing you need to say to me is I care about you. And like, it, I would just melt it in the moment. It's like, oh, I can't fight against that. I care about you. I love you. And I care about you. And so that's that, that's that part. So I'm just validating what you're sharing is like, yes, that's a part that needs to be loved. Right. And that's the way I receive love. And I, and what I've been saying to her is you're safe with me. You're safe with me. There's a part of her that fundamentally believes she isn't safe. She isn't safe to have feelings. She isn't safe to have her experience. She isn't safe to whatever it may be. And I'm like, I love you. And you're safe with me. You're safe with me. And every time she's like, Oh, it's like softening something. So, um, yeah. Yeah, my I did the same thing in my relationship. It's interesting because this came up the other day and um, something we, we were having a conversation about something and I could see the response coming from a place that wasn't authentic or true. It was coming from a trigger. And it was so awesome because I, again, I'm just like loving this, this one, just loving what I've learned from you. Because in that moment, I was able to slow down and observe the way I felt in receiving this. And rather than react from a, a triggered place, because that's what was going on. There was a, a war that was about to break out. I was just like, okay, what does he need to hear from me right now? And then I followed through with what I believed he needed to hear. And it just dissipated that tension instantly. And it, it was from being able to slow down. And I think that what I love is this awareness piece because, you know, all these things, like you said, are happening unconsciously and at warp speed. And we, we, we it's happening so quickly. It's a knee-jerk reaction. We have no control over it until we do, until we bring our awareness to these unconscious behaviours and make them conscious. That's that's what I believe is the evolution of of consciousness which can be experienced in relationships um when it comes to codependency and the and and the enmeshment or the entanglement that can take place in in that healing space of a relationship like what have you observed because you know that that is a delicate dance of being interdependent supporting each other in the healing but not falling into codependent patterns of victim rescuer dynamics which i think a lot of people may experience in relationships yeah codependency is a huge topic and it really comes down to what we were just talking with the trauma and the insecure nervous system is where the roots of codependence are as well it's like actually doing this work is codependence work you know um and it's a tendency to lose our sense of differentiation codependency codependency is essentially when we lose our sense of differentiation with the other and i merge my thoughts feelings you know my thoughts or feelings or my soul or my reality with yours and i'm unable to determine who's me and who are you and so what happens then is like um, whatever you feel, I'm going to feel, you know, or I'm going to feel some effect of, or like there's this intertwining, like anything that you do impacts me and I have no space or no ability to, to experience myself as a separate being from you. And that's what happens when we're in codependent. I love, I love to talk about codependency and using a, like an analogy of cells for anyone who can remember basic biology, um, cells in our body and our body is composed of trillions of cells, right? And they have, every cell has a membrane around it. And that membrane is a semi-permeable membrane, which means that things can move in and out of it. And those membranes, those boundaries, they're actually boundaries, allow one cell to be differentiated from another, which means they exist as separate yet interdependent 
relate relationally. So they're separate cells and they're interdependent. And what that means is they need each other. Like the cells can't exist on their own. They're all working together inside of this body that is me. Yet they're differentiated. So each cell is its own thing. Now, when the, those boundary walls are impacted, they're not, they're not able to maintain their integrity. They actually dissolve and you actually have cells now in meshing. The cells become like fused together or they get stuck together, right? Because they're not able to maintain differentiation. They're no longer separate cells. They're becoming, we have cancer. That is what cancer is. Cancer is physical codependence in the body, actually, you know? Whoa, I had no idea that's what happens. That's a mutation. That's like the, the yeah, wow. Yeah, it's, it's the inability of cells to maintain their differentiated integrity. So they're unable to maintain their separateness, right? But just because, and, that, and that's the, the tricky bit in our minds, right? It's like, well, how do you be in a relationship if you're separate, right? And that's like, there's this, because there's this constant balance between the forces of what a, you can think of as agency and communion or separateness and togetherness. Mm -hmm. You know, there are these, the, and everything, every part of the universe is grappling with these fundamental two forces, right? The electron that's floating around the atom that creates the structure of even a cell is in relationship between if it collapses into itself, it stops being, you have an implosion. If it separates, you you no longer have its integrity. So we're always in a balance of separateness and togetherness. Relationship is the same. We're in a constant dynamic balance between being a separate and differentiated self and being a couple, being a together, being a, being a us. And we have to balance that out. This is why relationships are so challenging because we're walking that line constantly it's a dynamic tension it never ends you never actually resolve it it's moment by moment by moment resolution of this tension right yeah. and so codependence happens when we go too far towards togetherness too far towards communion we now in mesh we get that cancer and then also the other side is easy to see if you go too far into independence there's no relationship right you've just got two people who you know you might still even live together but you're not having you're not in relationship anymore you're actually just doing your own thing right? You go to the full extreme and you're not even together anymore, right? So we're in that balance, that fine line. So in the spirit of using analogies to accommodate the way our brains process things, I love that. An analogy that I like that's quite opposite to yours, yours is like microscopic, you know, very zoomed in lens. Mine's quite zoomed out. Have you ever heard of binary stars? Yeah. So binary stars, for those who don't know, are two suns that are in orbit with each other. And I like to see relationships like that, you know, from far away, they're seen as one from the outside in, you know, like the binary star from our site from planet Earth looks like one star. But if you look closely, they're two separate stars and what's keeping them together is gravity and love is gravity. Mm -hmm. That's what binds us. Well, I mean, and, and what you're talking about is the same, like you don't even need to look at a binary star. It's beautiful. It's also the relationship of the earth to the sun, right? Mm. Is exactly the same thing. They're in orbit. If the earth got too close to the sun, it would fry to a crisp. There'd be yes. no, there'd be no sun. It's actually the space between them that allows life to flourish, you know? And yeah. so there's, there's the, the force of gravity that is pulling them together, but also somehow in that gravity is what allows an orbit to occur. So, you know, and everything's spinning around everything else in this universe. Absolutely. And I love that. And when, when, when you were just speaking about the space between it, it sparked a thought around what can occur when somebody's in a trauma response in an insecure attachment style. So, um, yeah, can, can you share a little bit on what the insecure attachment styles are and how they show up? in relationship sure so um they often talk about you know three you know it depends which model you look at which insecure attachment styles are so you know there, there are names that range from anxious avoidant fearful avoidant anxious avoidant which is another name for fearful avoidant and disorganized and i you know like i think the so i'm going to present like I don't think I'm actually going to talk about them all individually because I look at it a little bit different. I think the, I think the identification with a tendency is really good. I think it's useful if you're learning about attachment to like understand what is the difference between a more anxious attachment and a more avoidant attachment 
And, you know, then a lot of people like to think that they have disorganized attachment, which I'm uncertain about. I think disorganized attachment is pretty severe, um, pretty severe abuse to be disorganized. Um, okay. Maybe I'll talk about them. Okay. Anxious attachment is people who have a predominance towards what we just spoke about agency and communion. They have a predominance towards needing high levels of communion. They're, they're, they're seeking co constant connection with the other. The, the way an anxious, anxious attachment forms is when a child had like an inconsistent, um, inconsistent amount of presence and love. So sometimes it was there and sometimes it wasn't, you know, and a great example is the child is put in it in its because we have this insane idea that we should put children in a separate room from their mother and let them cry it out. Like it's just madness, this parenting idea. And unfortunately, you know, there was a whole generation of parents who were taught this is how you're supposed to do it, you know. Very sad, you know, for all of us who experience that. So you put a child in a cot in another bed, you know, and the child is like terrified, like its mum is its source of life, and all of a sudden mum's not around. You know, there's nobody around and it's like, I might actually die. Like a wolf could walk in this door and pick me up its jaws and just chomp, chomp me right now. That's what a, a child's doing that without thought. I might actually die right now. I'm alone. I'm going to die. That's what a child is. A child is 100% dependent. A, a newborn, an infant is 100% dependent on their parents. There's no two ways about it. So the child is like, I might die and start screaming, Right. Well, first maybe makes a few noises and then starts getting louder and louder and starts crying. Now, anxious attachment forms when the, the, the mother or the father or the caregiver, you know, after some time of crying, comes in, picks them up, soothes them, you know, maybe tonight takes them to the bed, then back in the cot the next night, right? And then there's this kind of like, you get the attention and the love, but you have to make a fuss about it first. Basically, that's the patterning of the anxious. So you have an anxious attacher growing up. And what happens the moment they don't respond to my text in a certain time frame, I go into high degrees of anxiety, I think I'm about to be abandoned, which is that newborn infant thinking I'm about to die. And I've gone hysterical. I, it's, it's been four hours, they read my message, and it's been four hours, and they haven't replied to me. And I am inconsolably out of control right? Now, all of a sudden, I'm like texting furiously. And then they, when they come back to their phone, they may have just been working out at the gym and they saw it, but they weren't ready to reply to it. And all of a sudden, there's like 40 messages of, of me getting more and more hysterical, right? That's anxious attachment. I need to get hysterical in order to get my attention and my love needs met. So anxious people are always teetering on the edge of like, are they going to abandon me? And I need to like, oh, oh, I need to like try and get them to stay close to me. And they've got all of these strategies. So I, I often, I actually think in strategies more than type, but we'll, we'll, the strategies are anxious strategies, which are come close to me strategies. They're strategies that reach out and try and pull the other close. They try and get the attention of the other, right? Avoidant attachment is more like, the baby's put in the cot in the other room. And this is not exactly how it forms. It can form in lots of different ways and there are personal dispositions as well, but this is just a crude way of describing it. The baby's put in the cot in the other room and starts crying and no one comes and cries louder and louder and no one comes. And the mum's sitting there going, I, I can't go into the room because, you know, I'm going to ruin this process of the baby learning to like be independent and not, not rely on me to put it to sleep, which is what they're trying to do. So the mum can get some damn rest or they're just irritable and be like, fucking, I don't want to go there and touch that kid right now. Like it's just too much, right? The kid cries it out. No one comes next night. No one comes next night. No one comes. Eventually the kid stops crying. Oh, peaceful. The kids stop crying. No, the kid has actually just realized that nobody's coming right? Nobody is going to come and soothe that kid. So they're like, fuck it. I'll soothe myself. I'll do it myself. And they do it by dissociating or numbing that experience of terror. They're in terror. I'm going to die. And they just dissociate and numb from it. They didn't die. So everything's fine. My, there's something wrong with my mom. Avoidance have this tendency to be there's something wrong with you, not me. Whereas anxious is there's something wrong with me, not you right? Avoidance are like, there's something wrong with everyone else. And they always go and date anxious people and anxious people date avoidant people. They're attracted to each other like magnets based on a fundamental principle of polarity, which we can talk about some other time. And so avoidance are like, um, their strategy is they, they become very uncomfortable with affection and closeness because closeness is something they didn't get 
you know, closeness. I don't need anybody. I, I don't need anybody to get my needs met. I can do it all on my own. I can take care of myself. Why are you being so needy and demanding? That's the avoidant tendency. When things get too close, they run, they bail. When any, and, and deep underneath, and we won't go too much into the trauma, but deep underneath the, the avoidant is a sense of like, if I get too close to this person, this is really tragic, actually. If I get too close to this person, I'm going to have to confront the experience of not being loved. And that's too painful. If I let them in and they leave me, I can't actually cope with that. So I'm going to cut and run before they bail on me. I'm going to bail first. That's the avoidant tendency. Yeah, I, I'm i just like having flashbacks to all my early 20s of like starting off anxious and then becoming avoidant mm -hmm. and that nitpicking and rejecting before I get rejected, all of that. And it was awesome because you actually brought this to my attention last year when we were working mm -hmm. together one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. And what I really loved about what you shared is that it, takes time for the nervous system to catch up so like to rewire and repattern these behaviors it takes how long well i think if you've if you've done a lot of personal development work and you know what you're doing i think nine months to a year you can get a pretty good grab okay. on it if you've got the right kind of practice in mind it's still going to take a few more years to fully land but nine months to a year and you'll be able to say i'm no longer fully anxious or i'm no longer fully avoidant right yeah if you haven't done any work, personal development work before, and this is new to it, you're probably going to need to work with a coach or a counselor or a therapist at the beginning to actually get a handle of what you need to do or do some really good programs um, to get a handle of what you need to do to do this work. And you're looking at two to five years. You're looking at two to five years of being, and the first year or two are probably not going to be fun. They're going to be painful and you're going to fuck up more times than you can imagine. You know, and you've got to be compassionate with yourself because you're not going to get it right. You're not going to learn this information and be like, I'm secure now. Sweet. No, no, you're going to fuck up tomorrow, you know, like or the next or next week. You know, it's like it's going to happen. You're going to get in a relationship and you're going to these patterns are going to come up and you're going to exhibit them over and over again. And and then little bit by little bit, you kind of catch yourself and you go, oh, I'm not going to do it this, this time. You know, and you do something a little bit different. And over time, those little bit of differences start to gain traction. And then they become significant. So it's a process. Totally. I um it's funny because sometimes when I meet people in the personal development world and I and we have this conversation around attachment theory, and I met with this statement, I'm secure. And I'm like, I don't I don't know if it's that well, simple. You know? What I love love asking people is like like, are you in a relationship? No, I'm single. This is I the people <laughs> that I usually say I'm secure. They're usually single and everyone else is a problem, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm secure. It's just I end up dating anxious people all the time. I'm like, oh, really? So it's everyone else's problem that you're not in a secure relationship. That's very interesting. You know, this, yeah. I, I often hear people go, I'm secure. I'm like, have you been in a five-year stable relationship? You know, you, yeah. have you been with your partner for at least five years with some degree of stability? Yeah. No, but, you know, I'm just waiting for the other secure person who'll finally meet me. I'm like, oh, okay. Good luck so, with that. <laughs> yeah, and it's I, <laughs> I fully resonate. Because um, it, well, I was going to say like this work requires actually humility. Humility yeah. is one of the cornerstones of this work. You actually mm. have to be humble to see where you're a mess in order to do something about it. If you can't admit and see where you're actually struggling in a mess, you will never heal it. It will always be someone else's fault. And the moment you make it someone else's fault, you're actually a victim. You're actually playing the victim card, you know? And this is what people, people, and there's people, it can be very subtle. Like you can be an empowered victim, right? I'm in my power. It's just no one else. Like, and I've got my boundaries and my sense. Like, no, actually you're still externally focused and you're still a victim. You know, you're a victim yeah. of not the world not meeting you. That's victimhood. So it's wild, right? So you and have to be humble. It's with victimhood is that it holds you in a disempowered state. Exactly. And so we don't actually have control at all. It looks empowering. I am empowered and everyone else is the problem, but it's not empowered at all. You're still you're still needing everyone else to do it for you even though it can seem like it isn't, you know, this is a development journey and some people, some people have to go through this stage first, 
you know? So, you know, compassion for that. Um, do you want me to finish talking about the other attachment styles or like, um, I feel like that's a, well, I feel like that's a great introduction for the two. I'd love to spend some time with you doing maybe a whole segment on attachment theory. Um, what I would love to speak into is the, um, I, I mean, I don't know if you feel like, if you feel like it's worth mentioning and should be spoken about, but what I, what I really want to speak into and what I loved is that when you brought my attention to this, you didn't just tell me about it. And then I identified with this label, which I see a lot of people doing. They, they almost use this label as an excuse. Oh, I'm anxious now. So you need to pander to my needs. Exactly. No, that's actually not it. Or I'm avoidant. So you just have to deal with the fact that I'm going to like bail whenever I want. It's like, no, that's, that's not it. (laughs) Yeah. So what I loved is that because of your programs, like the fundamentals of authentic relating and the work that we did one-on-one, I was able to zoom out and observe my behaviors and notice what it is and what it feels like when the avoidance comes in. And when I am starting to feel avoidant and leaning into a secure attachment style. So leaning into security and what that feels like, and it's unfamiliar and it's uncomfortable. So what, what can you share about secure attachment and how well, so the, so the interesting thing is the pathway to secure for each of the types, and we're just working with the two like gross, the, the two like main types in a way, you know, main categories. And I think there are lots of sub subcategories really, but so it's actually to cultivate the gift that the other has. So someone who's more anxious actually needs to learn independence. They need to learn to not rely on the other. So one of the things that I, you know, I do is, my partner and I, we have our own bedrooms. You know, we actually, like, we've just moved in together. We, you know, we've moved in together pretty quick, quicker than, not quicker than than I've done. I used to move in with people's, like, way too quick. But, you know, we really were, we really saw that we had chance for a deep partnership and we were, like, really, like, this is, this is it between us. And we were, like, we had opportunities to move in together earlier than that and we really took our time not to. And um, she has a son, so I would not see her sometimes, you know, I'd like not see her one week. And then the next week we'd spend like four days together. So there was like lots of time apart. And so for more anxious nervous system is to get really comfortable with time apart, really comfortable with making sure I cultivate my own friendships and my own hobbies and my own relationship to my work. And now we've moved in together and I have my own bedroom and I sleep in my own bed, maybe three to four nights a week. We sleep together, maybe three to four nights a week. And I sleep alone three to four nights a week in my own energy. I let, I let myself be in my own space. I enjoy my own space. I'm more anxious, right? I'm actually more anxious. I have some avoidant tendencies and we usually have a mix of them. And the avoidant is to learn to show up, to learn to like, oh, I need to run and lean back in and be like, and own it, be more vulnerable, share their needs, share their vulnerability. The avoidant usually thinks they have no needs. That's their biggest problem. And their healing is actually to start being vulnerable with their needs. I actually need time with you. I need affection. I need, I need connection. I need, you know, for the avoidant to go, I need connection is like, like they'd, some of them, if they're really deep in avoidance would rather die than ever admit that they need connection with somebody. It's like, I would rather die than tell anybody I need them. You know, so the avoidant is actually to learn dependency, to learn to be more connection oriented, right? Another way of thinking about this is like the anxious is because the anxious is hyper attuned. The anxious has developed a hyper attuned level of sensitivity. So they can feel the moment the avoidant checks out. Oh, like you can feel it. You could, you could actually feel it from across the globe. Like people who are really anxious, you know, someone, your, your partner is traveling in another country. You know, the minute they're flirting with somebody, it's like wild. It's like suddenly anxiety washes through your body and you're like, what the hell is happening? It's like, there's a hyper attunement to the connection. And so they need to like back off on that a little bit. But because of that hyper attunement, they know where we're going. The avoidant kind of is the regulation, the regulator of how fast we go. Because if we go at the anxious speed, we end up enmeshed. We end up codependent without a doubt. So the, the avoidant actually regulates how fast we go. They get, they're, they're the foot on the brake. They're like, slow down. We need to spend a little bit more time apart. And the anxious is like, no, yes, we do. You know, and the anxious is like, we need to go that direction. That's the direction we're heading. And the avoidant has to go, oh God, that's commitment, you know, and moving in together in partnership. Okay, I'm going to trust that, right? You know, so there's this, we're working together. Actually, 
these two attachment styles have the potential to heal each other or destroy each other, right? Depending on how we meet them. And secure attachment isn't a sense of like, I don't need anybody. That's, that's glorified avoidance. And in, a, in, a, in some of the spiritual communities, you'll have that. It's mm-hmm. actually just glorified avoidance. Secure attachment is a bonding process. We are wired to bond, mm. but you bond with enough space to maintain a differentiated self. So it's interdependence mm-hmm. and interdependence includes both independence and dependence. Mm. So we're both dependent on each other because we've formed a unit that we give each other the, the, some, some of the primary needs, mm. physical affection, quality time, togetherness, a sense of shared purpose. We give each other some of the most fundamental needs that we have as humans. And we're also independent because we're still separate beings mm. and we have differences. We have things that I'm interested in things that she isn't, you know, and I need time to cultivate that part of my life and be in friendships and experiences that are meaningful to me as she does for her. Right? Mm. And that's how we move into skill, which is an interdependent relationship. And as you said, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of work and can be painful for the first couple of years and because it does it bring is. up all this stuff. And what I really loved is where we started with this conversation, the space mm. between, not the whole conversation, just this topic in the conversation. It's that mm-hmm. space between and creating that healthy space to have mm. that interdependence. Yeah. Wow. And, and so, and so we really need, you know, like if, if you're listening to this and this is all new to you, you know, we really need guidance through this process, mm. you know, and then you have people like myself and yourself, and there are lots of other people out in the world who are like really offering guidance of, of pathways through this, you know, we're like, we're, you know, I love this idea of we're all walking each other home, you know, like, you know, and it's going to be tumultuous to recognize that, like, if you're new to this work, it's it's going to be challenging, right? It just is. There's no escape from that. And so you got to give, be compassionate with yourself. You've got to be compassionate with your partner. You've got to be compassionate with the process. Have appropriate guidance. Have good, really good reality checks. You know, something that I've been doing lately has been connecting with other couples, couple to couple, and talking about our difficulties. And it's like, Oh, it's so nice to go. We're not alone. Like, actually, I have challenges in my relationship. We have healing processes that we have to go through and we meet them with as much grace and elegance as we can and as much humility. And when we fuck up, we apologize and learn from it. Right. But that doesn't just because I've been doing this work for so long doesn't mean I'm not completely free of the challenges right there. And and anyone who thinks there are, I'm very skeptical about their relationship, yeah. you know. And, I, and this is something that I've discovered because I've been doing this work since my last relationship and now I'm in a new relationship and, you know, we've been, it's been almost six months and it's like the problems don't go away. It's how we navigate them. And, you know, I think this is something that you might relate with is like going back to the nervous system and being able to communicate from regulation, being able to identify when the dis- dysregulation is, you know, coming up and being able to self-regulate in those moments to heal mm-hmm. that trauma. Um, well, the, the, I, the, yeah. the problems don't go away. They become opportunities for healing and evolution. That's what yeah. they actually are. Yeah. They're not even problems in the first place. They're actually opportunities. Yeah. You know, they're opportunities to either recognize this isn't a healthy relationship and move away. Or if, if we have someone who's like willing to do this work with us, then they're opportunities for healing and evolution. And they may hurt sometimes. And they may be like, whoa, that was a big one. And we really went through that, but now we're learning from it, you know, and there are ways that we can take any challenge or any difficulty we have in our relationship and evolve and grow and heal from them. Yes, I love that. And that that's the full circle. That's that's the full circle of this conversation. So for people who are listening and wanting to um explore, you know, the fundamentals of relating, you have a program called the Fundamentals of Authentic Relating. Um as this is the first podcast that is being launched and available for people to listen to. Um 
I would love to extend an invitation to people who are wanting to to join this this you're you're doing what when when are you doing it? They're gonna be running they run regularly. So the next yeah. one is starting on I don't know when this is gonna be launched, but it's starting on the thirty first. Well, if you're in Australia, it's the first of September, it's the thirty first of August if you're in the US. This is a US friendly time slot. We do time slots at friendly either for Europe or the US, you know, mm. most of them are good for Australia. It's Australia daytime. So if you're, you know, if you, if you're at home and then the next one will be starting four weeks after that, which will be a evening slot in, in Australia. And also there'll be a European slot as cool. well. So they're every four to eight weeks apart. Um, and I like, I have so much desire to share programs on a, attachment theory i have programs on nervous system regulation I, on polarity Ooh. on transpersonal relating like all of that's coming and like the truth the truth is it's not, like i'm not going to be able to set it up this way but actually i would want everyone to start with fundamentals of authentic relating because it's like the other stuff is hard if you don't know how to relate properly it's really challenging to move towards a secure attachment you can you can study attachment theory till the cows come home another metaphorical language you know for as long as you want and not know how to do it with your partner because you don't know how to relate to your partner. So this is the fundamental, this is why it's the cornerstone of evolutionary relating. It is the building block that allows everything else to start growing out of, you know, the, the way we relate to each other allows us to move towards having evolutionary relating, evolutionary relationships, relationships that heal and grow us into the most exquisite love filled beings we could be mm, sorry for effects. interrupting your offer <laughs> no i love that i really love that and it's interesting because i see how when we heal the relationships we have with ourselves the ripple effect that has when we can start to implement and practice secure attachment with our children so yes. that they're not having to experience this trauma in their relationships to come yep. so um yeah i really love i love that and I'm going to add all your details in the bio. So for anyone who is interested, um, the Instagram handle is ever relating. So E V O relating. And um, yeah, if you're interested in joining these programs, we're currently in the year 2022. So who knows how long this will be up on all the interwebs. Um, but I'm sure. Fundamentals of Authentic Relating will be continuing. You know, our yeah. goal is to have. Next year, I would love to have more than a thousand people go through this program. I have a, a team of facilitators who are now running this program. I, I no longer run it personally. I do a couple of group coaching sessions through it, but it's all it's got all pre recorded theory, and the facilitators running it are like badass. They're so good, and so we have more coming through. So our desire is to run more and more of these. This is like I want the world to be able to relate with these skills, you know. And I teach it in a non dogmatic way. We're not teaching you you know, what you should do, we're giving you skills so that you can find your own unique way to authentic, authentically relate. Yeah. And that's what I love about it. I mm -hmm. love that the authenticity and the um, empower, empowerment to, to express ourselves with, with our, with our truth. Yeah. So yeah. Thank and the you. website is evolutionaryrelating.org.org. Evolutionaryrelating.org. Yeah. All of this will be in the bio um thank you Thanks, thank Sam. you so Pleasure much i'm always. so excited to have more conversations with you my intention is I'm to have you on to here be on more yeah i want yeah. you on here regularly offers so much insight and i feel like listeners can can gain so much from you so thanks thank you